Okay, so welcome everyone. And uh, as usual, we'll get started here in just a minute. We're gonna do some introductions. We'll go around the, the group and let everybody do a brief introduction of themselves. And then Laura can do a brief introduction of herself and then we'll get started. So um, right now, let me change my view here so I can see as many people as possible. Right now, the first person I have on my list is Mitchell Hobbs. So why don't we go ahead and start with Mitchell. Hello. Um, uh, yes, I'm Mitchell Hobbs. I'm from the University of Sydney. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here today. Thanks for having me. Okay, then we have Maureen Taylor. And Hi, I'm Maureen Taylor. I teach at University of Technology Sydney just down the road from Mitchell and Michael. UTS is sandwiched between the two other two universities in Sydney. And I am calling in tonight. But I, my groceries are here. I got to go there real quick. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know they always come at this time and um i study um civil society nation building and i'm calling in from the united states where it's like 97 degrees here in knoxville tennessee uh let's see uh why don't i'll, I'll do this since he's not here uh chris why don't you go next yeah hello i'm chris him i am based in chicago loyola university chicago uh, before joining the loyola i worked as a pr professional based in south korea and i spent two decades there as a ceo in charge of the management or consulting to the pr professionals there i'm happy to be part of this team as a young generation <laughs> great <laughs> meeting you <laughs> Excellent, excellent. All right, well, two decades of uh, CEO. Maybe we move you up into the, the middle child area. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, let's see who's next. How about Luke? Hello, uh, Luke Capizzo. I'm an assistant professor at James Madison University in Virginia, uh, calling in tonight from Washington, DC. Uh, great to see everyone. Excellent. Gianni, why don't you tell us your story? Oh, hello, everyone. Nice to see you again. Uh, I'm Jianyi Chen, a third year PhD student at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. Uh, I'm doing uh, my PhD in corporate crisis communication on Twitter. I'm very great to see you here again. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Let's go to Sue Mei, who's also young, new to our, our area. Hi, my name is Sue Mei. Um, I am doing my PhD at QUT Business School. In fact, one of my supervisors is here, Dr. Anne Lane. Um, and I'm very excited to um, learn from Laura because I read a lot about your work in engagement. So nice to meet everyone. Excellent, excellent. Well, actually, why don't we go to Dr. Lane since uh, you mentioned her. And before we go any further, I need to just let Sue May know in case she hasn't picked up the Kim's also here as well. So, oh boy, you're going to be in trouble. Anyway, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't see everyone. <laughs> she is not going to be in uh, trouble. <laughs> sorry. Anyway, yeah, so hello, my name is Anne. Um, I'm interested in teaching, researching, and applying uh, questions around dialogue, obviously, working a lot with Michael, and also to do with engagement. And recently I've moved into, oh, that's such a good look for you, Michael, um, into the area of organizational storytelling and looking for ways that it can be applied meaningfully and effectively in public relations, particularly media relations. Cool. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, since Dr. Johnston's name was mentioned twice, we don't want it to return into anything crazy. So why don't we have her introduce herself? Hello. Oh, can you see me? I yeah, can't yeah. see. You can. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm um, Kim Johnston. I'm an associate professor at uh, QUT Business School. Um, my interests are in engagement, um, all types of engagement, community employee, um, social impact and social license to operate. And yes, hello, Sue May. <laughs> um, and I do a lot of work with uh, Professor Maureen Taylor and Dr. Anne Lane and Dr. Bree Hurst as well. I apologize. So I didn't see you it's just now. Okay, bye. I can't see myself most times, so that's fine. Okay, bye. Okay. Michael, I took over while we were getting groceries. So uh, we still have uh, Kieran and uh, Shima, I think are the last two. Okay. Kieran, are you there? Hi, 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 Maureen and Michael. 
How you doing? You, wanna, you wanna introduce yeah. yourself to yeah. everybody? Quick intro. Sure. I'm Kiran and I, Kiran Jit, and I'm from uh, Kuala Lumpur. I teach at the University of uh, Technology Mara. I'm now more of a professor, honorary professor there. So I'm not really teaching a class this, this semester. I help out more with the training and uh, some consultancy work. Great. So okay. thank you. And I think you said Shima was the last. Shima, who is the reason for this whole workshop? Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Very nice to see you all again. I'm Shima Sani'i, a last year PhD student at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. Um, Professor Michael Kent is my supervisor. Uh, and at the moment, uh, my PhD has focused on activist public relations. Oh, we forgot Chuck. Sorry, Chuck. I, I was hoping to get away with it. I'm, I'm a shy person. <laughs> Ma Maureen was saying the old guard. I'm the old, old guard. Um, I, I just retired. What is it? Is today the 29th? 29 days ago um, uh, from the University of Kansas. Uh, my corporate background before that being there forever was, uh, it's one reason I'm here. I'm so interested in the topic tonight is uh, I did a lot of employee relations work at American Airlines and JCPenney. So I'm really looking forward to this tonight. Okay. Okay, cool. and um, I'm Michael Kent. <laughs> I started this and I'm at University of New South Wales. For any, anybody who doesn't know me, I think you all know me. <laughs> uh, my turn. <laughs> yes, you are the lady of the hour. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, what a fun group. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm Laura Lemon. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Alabama. I'm about to start my fifth year um, here at the university, which is pretty incredible that how fast time is flying. Um, in terms of my background, I got my undergraduate degree at Pepperdine University, my master's degree at the University of Colorado at Denver, and my PhD at the University of Tennessee which is how I came in connection with Michael and Maureen. Um, prior to pursuing my PhD, I spent seven years doing public relations for nonprofit organizations in Denver, Colorado, two different types of organizations, one helping children in the foster care system find families, the second helping individuals that might lose their arms or legs to cancer, infection, or trauma. Um, Although I thought that was going to be the direction that my research would take, I was really more interested in employee engagement and internal communication, simply because I know what it's like to be uh, an employee. And so my research focus really takes um, an applied approach by hoping to extend uh, most of the literature that tends to take more of a functional approach when looking at employee engagement and internal communication. Um, the scholars on this call, um, are often cited, um, I often cite their works and blue, um, align with their perspectives on how we're moving the, the field forward in terms of our understanding of um, what is the uh, employee experience, how can we move away from making them an assumed stakeholder group, and how can we construct internal communication that is meaningful for our internal audiences beyond um, increasing productivity, right? So doing it because it's the right thing to do. So that's my research uh, interest, but I'm a qualitative research researcher and that's um, what I specialize in. So I spent some time looking at a lot of the previous uh, presentations and a lot of them were focused on, on people's research agendas, theory, but today I'm gonna take a really uh, practical approach. So this presentation is really about behind the scenes of how I conduct qualitative research um, my version, version of best practices in a way so that we can increase rigor um, and move away from people thinking that qualitative methods are easy, right? Um, because a lot of it is what we do in everyday life, for example, interviewing. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what, what works best for me. The papers that I provided were actually from my dissertation. I had three manuscripts that came from my dissertation, two, um, primary research pieces, I broke those based on the two research questions I had, and then one method piece. Um, and the method piece was looking at mindfulness um, techniques that researchers can use to increase awareness and increase self-reflexivity. So that's going to be sort of the second portion of our conversation today. So 
just a quick um, preview. I'm gonna go through each one of the sections that you would find in a paper. So I realize there's a lot of well-established scholars on this call, but in my mind, I'm thinking about how can I help PhD students um, get the skills that they need to go out there and conduct quality, qualitative research. So um, I'm also open to questions as we go. So you can drop them in the chat if you want, you can interrupt me, I don't care. We can wait till the end. Um, but if there's something that piques your interest as we go, please don't hesitate to ask. So um, we're gonna go through each section of a paper. I'm gonna provide you know, some of the tips and tricks of the things that I do um, so that we can kind of get some insight and some behind the scenes perspective of how do you do this and how do you do this well, um, simply to bring some method to the madness, right? So I'm sure we've seen this meme around Twitter and it is kind of a reflection of qualitative methods, right? It's crazy, it's wild, there's a lot of different processes and approaches that you can take. Um, but I'm a big fan of structure and being really strategic in the way that we approach the steps so that we can increase our rigor so that the methods that we do can be trusted and the findings that we come up with can make a contribution to our field. So is there any questions before we begin? Um, can I just ask if everybody's seeing the whole slide? Yes. I'm only getting a piece of them. I'm not sure if it's something on my screen or uh, I'm still, I'm getting what looks like Elton John or something. Yeah. So do you only see half of it though? I just see Elton John's head. Oh. Let me, Let me uh, I can see all of them and I'm on my phone. Okay. okay. I can see it all as well. Okay. Then let me. Uh, I'll, I'll play around with it and see if I can figure out how to uh, change the view. Cool. Everybody else good? All right. So. I got it. Oh, yeah. Chris. I saw a hand go up. Oh, just kidding. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's okay. No worries. All right. So best practices in terms of justifying. So when we think about a method section, right, the very first paragraph that we would ever read when we get to that method section, we should really address why we've chosen this particular method. I almost wish sometimes when I review journal articles that even quantitative scholars stro you know, strived to do this because it would be helpful in helping us understand how this particular method is going to answer the research questions that have been provided. Qualitative methods, as we know, offers a lot of really great aspects that quantitative methods do not. And so the first one being um, is, that we're, this is occurring in a natural setting. So I don't do ethnographic work very often, um, but to conduct ethnographic work, you have to go to the place in which you're hoping to collect data. So if you're interested in the lived experience of doctors and nurses in a hospital, you're gonna have to go to the hospital setting, do participant observation and do focus groups um, and interviews and, and gather what data you can from that particular setting. So a lot of times um, quantitative research is done, as we know, in more of a um, lab setting. And the thing that qualitative offers us is that it's in a natural setting. And oftentimes that setting is um, determined by our participants. And so we let our participants sort of drive what works best for them. The second um, component to think about of what qualitative methods offers in terms of justifying it as a method is researcher as participant. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this once I get to the mindfulness piece, um, but this is a really key component because the researcher does not operate in a vacuum. We are co-creating data with our participants. Um, and so just as much as our influence, you know, we're hoping for the participant to influence the conversation, we also have influence. So before walking into a research setting, first of all, we have to be aware of our own identity. What sort of um, identities do we have and how is that going to play into the power dynamics when we engage in an interview conversation or when we conduct a focus group? Now, a lot of us are gonna be PhD students, uh, assistant professors, full professors, associate professors. Um, and so there's already going to be a little bit of a power dynamic. And so we're gonna to wanna to work through um, rapport building and sort of establishing relationships on the front end to help feel to help our participants feel more comfortable. But it's also important to keep in mind that your identity can also be key to giving you access. There are certain groups and um, individuals that 
may not be as open to talking with me um, because I'm a white female living in the United States, right? So there might be other groups, um, other individuals that could speak to different people um, based on their identity. And so doing some self-reflexivity and, and understanding how your own identity might help bring access, but it also might um, create a power dynamic when you are collecting data. So the key component is recognizing that researcher as participant is key. Um, the communication that we have in collecting data that's qualitatively based um, is driven by our, our, by our participants. Now, um, the P one of the pieces I provided, they refer to their uh, participant as the subject. I'm not really a big fan of that. They're really more of a participant because we aren't observing them. Um, but the, the conversation that we have with them is driven by their thoughts, their feelings, uh, their experiences that they have had. And so it's really based on them. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that when we get to data collection. Um, also to keep in mind that there is an intention, intentionality, right? We're seeking to capture the lived experience of our participants, recognizing that we're trying to capture them and preserve the communication using symbols um, and making sure that we are understanding the perspective um, that our participants intended to convey to us. And the last piece is that qualitative methods are pragmatic, right? So we're in an applied field. So not only do we need to have implications for theory building, but we also need to have implications for the field. And so this is where we kind of hit at, this is the so what, why does your research matter? And for us, theoretically and um, practical implications need to be considered. And so when we're drafting our method section, boom, this is our first paragraph. And this is where we can highlight hey, this is why we're, we've chosen this method. Um, this is also a nice opportunity to highlight a method that's not frequently used in our field. I feel as though public relations is really starting to broaden our horizons in terms of the methods that we use. One of the papers I provided for you from my dissertation was a phenomenological study. There's not a lot of phenomenological work in public relations. There's a lot done, um, surprisingly, in the education medical, uh, like nursing fields, as well as even in some marketing. And so in that first section of the method section, I had to explain um, the value of phenomenology and what this, what phenomenological studies would offer the field of public relations. And so, especially if you're thinking of exploring something new and unique, justifying it ahead of time so that your reviewers don't start dinging you right away, it's like you're already dotting your I's and crossing your T's because you're anticipating the fact that they're gonna want you to explain more. So um, in a nutshell, best practices and justifications also things that I look for when I review journal articles. Um, any of the folks in the room have uh, questions about this? Okay. All right, so sampling, I'm not gonna go through all the sampling uh, procedures, um, purposive and um, snowball sampling and all the different ways we can find people to be in our studies. But there's a couple of things that I wanted to point out that might be helpful when we're thinking about um, recruiting people. Uh, what do we offer them, especially for cold calling? And then also how do we keep our data organized? You're gonna see some examples throughout this presentation of how I stay organized, which is incredibly, um, important in qualitative research, especially because we have a lot of data um, and this enhances the credibility of the work that we do. So one of the uh, key components I wanna talk about first is recruitment. I have no problem cold calling people. I know that's not everybody's, um, they're not most comfortable with that. Um, but one of the things that I encourage you to do when you are going to be out there recruiting people is to develop a one-sheeter. This is one and a half, <laughs> but use this to accompany your emails. Um, because it's something that they can print off, they can take with them to talk to the higher ups or the powers that be that are those people that are in decision making and say, this is exactly what I'm looking for to participate in this study. Um, this is also going to be helpful for, um, you know, coming with an agreement, especially if you're doing a case study. I've utilized something similar um, for my case study research. I did a large case study for a government contractor. They had to get approval. Um, all the way up to the highest level of the Department of Energy for me to come in and do the work that I did. 
And uh, this particular document, somewhat similar, laid out what I was willing to do for them and what they would get out of the study. It's also important that you can come to an agreement on um, publishing the findings, because a lot of times you might find things that organizations aren't comfortable knowing. <laughs> it's a surprise. Your internal communication practices aren't what you thought they were. Um, and so it's uncomfortable for them, but you still want to be able to do what you can with the data that you found. Um, and so these one sheeters are a really nice um, opportunity to just have something tangible to say, this is what it's about. This is the purpose. Um, this is what will be taking place. And this is what you're requesting from the organization. Obviously, this is from when I was at Tennessee. So, um, you know, I've adapted it as I've navigated um, this section of my career as an assistant professor at Alabama. Um, but for those of us that are afraid of cold calling, this is helpful and can be a really nice thing to accompany your emails. Um, the other thing that I like to offer, and you can offer in the end, you can include in a document like this, or um, just simply do it, and that is going to be an executive summary. So most of our participants, whether that's individuals or organizations, are not going to read our academic work. Sorry, <laughs> it's unfortunate, but it's probably the case um, because they don't have the access to the journal articles. They can't afford it. Don't you know? Don't want to pay the price. Um, and so uh, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, and so what I do is I take everything and sort of compile it into an executive summary that is. Um, tangible and meaningful to these organizations, right? So um, for my dissertation, I interviewed 32 different people from a variety of different organizations and a variety of different industries. So I sent it actually to each person that I interviewed and made it applicable to them. They don't care about the details of the methods that you read in the Journal of Public Relations Research piece. They don't care about the theoretical um, background as well as my contribution to theory. They want to know, well, what can I do with this today in my organization? And so providing an executive summary is a really nice way to continue to build relationships um, and to say thank you. Um, I don't pay my participants. I haven't paid for participants before. And so this is my way of saying thank you. And um, it's a really nice way to meet in the middle. I had one participant that wanted the full dissertation. I was happy to provide that to him. I will also say that my dissertation, three of the individuals I talked to were um, worked for a government contractor. And that government contractor um, experience was very different than other employees. So I um, kept that relationship going. And that actually ended up into a case study um, that I did at two different sites. I had a sample population of 77 um, between focus groups and interviews. And it all started from my dissertation, but again, just using this as a tool to build relationships. So this is something that's worked for me and I think is a really nice best practice in terms of building relationship with your sample participants. The other thing I like to do is stay organized. <laughs> so you're going to see a lot of spreadsheets and I've mentioned that. And so this is actually from um, my dissertation spreadsheet. Um, it's called my sample spreadsheet. If anybody ever works with me, this is something that we do. I just got done um, working on a big project with a colleague of mine here at Alabama. We were looking at uh, Research One institutions gathering the experience is uh, vice presidents of research, directors of research centers, communication uh, professionals for those research centers, as well as tenure track faculty uh, to better understand not only their employee experience, their engagement experience in the midst of COVID, um, so crisis and their how they dealt with burnout. Um, and then we also were looking at how they build interdisciplinary research teams. And so my colleague worked with me and I you know, it was a qualitative project. So I led the way and said, here, this is what we do. So I'm a big fan of doing um, a sample spreadsheet for a couple of reasons. Number one, it keeps you organized, organized as you go. When you have 32 participants, or in my case of the government contractor, 77, it's a lot of individuals to keep track of. And so being organized is key. Number two, it helps with theoretical sampling. I start to see who I've talked to and who I need to talk to. Why? Because I do initial memoing right away. And those memos serve as my initial data analysis um, that starts to open my eyes as to, okay, so I usually start with a purposive sample, rely on some snowball sampling, um, especially if I'm doing a cold call approach. But then all of a sudden it's like, shoot, I haven't talked to this particular person. So for my dissertation, um, it became apparent that I 
was talking to most corporate organizations and um, at higher levels. As you can see, I've got like vice president, talent manager, business development manager. So I needed to find people lower down and I needed to find small businesses. And so my sample spreadsheet really helped me identify that. I've removed some identifying information, um, but usually I have their contact information, their, their real name. This is where I assign pseudonyms. You can have their industry, salary, title, location. You can change that to region if you wish whether or not you've been um, in contact with them, how long they've been with the company. So you can easily plug that information in. Um, those first three people, I don't have that here because those people refused to be audio recorded. So I had to go back and gather that information. You'll see, I also include the length of the interview, the number of transcript pages, and if I did member checks. Um, the transcript pages, all of this is my method section done, right? So you're not sitting down to write a method section and then all of a sudden you have to go through all your interviews and uh, put together a participant profile, um, you know, figure out how, you know, the length of your interviews, the average, the range, as well as how many transcript pages you have. So boom, it's already here for you. Um, again, a little bit of <laughs> method to the madness to make your lives a lot easier. Um, the other thing that this can lead to is a participant profile, so utilizing a table. Um, qualitative methods, man, we are, every word counts, right? So the word limits that most journals have, um, we have to work within the confines of those. And <clears throat> you end up having to cut people, and that sucks. Um, but utilizing a table gives you some more space, you know, versus having to write all of this out in the body, um, the body of your, of your manuscript. Um, so I'm a really big fan of this um, sort of approach, helps write the method section, leads the theoretical sampling because you can see I memo right after I'm done with my interviews. I'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of how I go through an interview and I'm gonna cover that here shortly. Um, and it's all here and you can go back and reference it. So it's a big help for me. Um, it's something that one of the, my colleagues that I worked with at Tennessee did, and I've just adapted it and it's been incredibly helpful. I use Excel as well for data analysis and we will get there shortly. All right, so best practices in data collection. So we talked about sampling, we talked about justification. So let's talk a little bit about processes and um, sampling questions seem to be doing feel about regarding sample size. Yes, there is a debate happening about this right now. Um, so thank you, Mitchell. I'm going to stop and answer this question and then I will move to the interviews. Um, so what Mitchell's talking about is there's a conversation going on right now in the field about sample size. And there is an argument um, also sort of underpinning that, that we should no longer be relying on information redundancy or saturation to justify how large our sample is, which means we started hearing the same thing over and over, and so we can stop collecting data. Some people are arguing that that's not even necessary. Um, and so what is the optimal sample size? So if you're doing a phenomenological study, it could be eight people. Why? Because it says um, that this particular type of method says, you know, you only need to capture the essence of the phenomenon. It's not about a number. This need to quantify our sample is because we have to operate in a quantitative world, um, which is unfortunate. And so because most um, people that review work tend to be quantitative scholars. Um, there's just more quantitative work that is done in general. And so we're kind of, you know, in, a, in some way trying to fit, um, fit in the box, right? To say, hey, we're, we, we justify ourselves. Um, in terms of a number, Mitchell, because people always want to know a number, um, I shoot for 20. <laughs> so if there's a magic number, it's the number that I usually shoot for. If it's a little bit less than, I think it's fine. Um, if you get to be too many, it can feel overwhelming. So my sample that I mentioned uh, for my government contractor case study of 77 was a lot. Um, probably 
almost too much, but the reason I had so many is because 56 of that was um, from focus groups. And so I only did 21 interviews. So optimal, optimal size, I'm just gonna say 20. I think 20 is going to appease um, a reviewer. 20 is not going to um, raise any red flags if you didn't collect enough data. There's nothing worse than submitting a study and somebody saying, oh shoot, you gotta go out and collect more data. So I'd strive for 20 if I was you, um, but if you can find some good sources in that, in that method section to justify your sample. I would encourage you to include that as well. So if you ever come across something like that, that can be helpful. So um, let's transition on to talk a little bit about interviews. So of course we know there's a variety of different um, tools that we can use to collect data. Um, we can do document analysis, focus groups, ethnographic work, participant observation. Um, but I'd say the one that's most commonly used in qualitative work is interviews. And um, because we live in a society where we're constantly interviewing, people seem to think that interviewing is easy, right? We interview every day. Did you, um, did you go to the beach today? How are you handling the winter? How's coffee? Uh, did you see the new movie on Netflix? Have you been to that new restaurant? Did you get takeout, et cetera, et cetera. We are constantly asking questions of the people in our lives that sort of serve as interview questions. But the reality is, is that interview work is intellectually demanding and requires a real focus in the present moment. So that is um, gonna be how I incorporate some of the mindfulness um, tools that I talk about here towards the end of the presentation. Um, I would not recommend doing more than two to three interviews per day. I realize for the, for the folks in the room that are working on their dissertations that, um, you might need to do more. And sometimes that just happens, right? You're on a time crunch, you've gotten access to people. So you're gonna say yes, right? So when I was doing that government contractor case study, I went to Texas for 36 hours. I did four focus groups and 10 interviews. It was insanity and I would never recommend that, but I was there, I had to do it. And they kept bringing in, you know, oh, do you wanna to talk to the CEO? Oh. Um, you know, the site manager's here. Are you open to talking to him? Sure, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. You know, send me whoever you got. Bring it along. I can tell you by the end of the day, I was exhausted. The last focus group was not my best focus group um, for sure, but it's just the nature of the beast. Um, but if you can stick to two or three, um, and that doesn't matter if you're in person, on Zoom or on the phone, they are still intellectual, intellectually taxing activities, right? That require a lot of energy. Um, and so what distinguishes an in-depth interview is that our conversation is evolving with our participants, right? And so we're trying to accumulate knowledge from a conversation with a person that represents a particular group that we are interested in, or they have an experience that we are very interested in. And so we're really trying to capture that and to get them to share, um, how they experience that, their perspectives, the feelings that they might have about a particular situation and treating it as a conversation. So I really like to see interviews not as a um, one-sided grilling interrogation. It's definitely a conversation. It should begin as a conversation and end as a conversation. But the ultimate goal of our um, interviews is to understand our participants' worldview, right? We wanna do our best to capture what their lived experience is, recognizing that um, a couple of things. Number one, people do not narrate their lived experience from a neutral position, right? We all come to this place with life experiences, identities that construct who we are in this particular moment. Number two, people are cultural am animals who come equipped with cultural codes that shape the structure and content of our conversations, um, especially on that particular occasion, right? They might have come uh, from a meeting or they had a um, in argument with their partner and so they show up and they aren't their best self or they were running late and so they're exhausted or they were up all night because they have a new kid. I mean, there's a variety of different things that impact who they show up as in that moment. And so that definitely plays a role in the conversation that you're having. But ultimately, um, we have to keep in mind that the meaning and reality exists through the interaction and the reconstruction of narratives. And so that's what interviews are. We are seeking to reconstruct narratives from our participants' lived experience. 
So in terms of processes, best practices, um, good qualitative interviews should be 30 minutes to two hours. And the reason I say 30 minutes is simply because you want to give your participant enough to say all they can about that particular topic. And so sometimes that can be done in less than 30 minutes. I'm going to share some experiences here shortly. Um, but in most cases, it needs to probably be 30, 40, sometimes 50 minutes. I would encourage everybody in your method sections to include, include a range, right? Because you're going to get those quick talkers, those non-talkers, where it's 25 minutes, then you're going to get the long talker with 75 minutes, and that's going to average out your, your length of interview. And so it's really important to include that information. The reality is that some participants are going to be more verbose than others, and that is okay. It's okay to have those quiet talkers and it's okay to have the people that just go on and on and on. Um, but most people in general, from my experience, enjoy talking about themselves. And so um, I know that interviews can be intimidating. Sometimes your first is not your best, that's okay. Um, but the reality is, is that once you get people talking um, and you start with those grand questions, people are gonna feel really comfortable sharing about themselves. You as the researcher need to be cautious of a couple of things, right? So we wanna make sure that we are not adding too much of our own commentary. This means that we have to be okay with silence because you're gonna ask a question, right? You're gonna ask somebody a question about a particular experience that they had. And you're gonna to have to pause and you're gonna to have to be okay with the pause and you're gonna to have to be okay with that dead space it's fine for them because they're thinking, right? They're thinking about what they wanna say. Um, sometimes a question might catch somebody off guard and they might feel, um, again, that power role, they might feel they have to come up with the right answer. Um, not always, there is no right answer. I always tell my participants, it's like whatever your experience is, that's what your experience is and that's what I'm trying to capture. Um, but again, we don't wanna fill that dead space with commentary. We just want to let them think and we wanna be able to give them time to respond. Um, we also wanna be sure that we aren't imposing our own experiences or judgments or concepts into the conversation. We really want to elicit the participants experience um, when we're having our conversation with them and let them lead us through the discussion. So before you begin the interview, um, I would do your best to do any research you can on the either the context or the situation or the participant. In my dissertation, I had some um, higher profile individuals who definitely quizzed me on what I knew about them and their career. So it was good that I had done a little bit of LinkedIn uh, snooping <laughs> prior to the interview, um, especially if you're doing an organizational um, interview or case study. You don't need to have like all the nuts and bolts figured out because you don't work there, but you should have a general understanding of how things operate. Um, oftentimes, especially with case study work, you're going to have a point person. Maybe they can provide you an organizational chart. They can walk you through some of the background. Um, there's always, as we all know, storytelling, right? There's some stories that underpin the culture of the organization um, that you might need to be privy to to better understand the conversation that you might be having with participants at that organization. Um, and so do any research that you can um, on the situation and participant before you begin. You should also really know your interview guide. Not like word for word, uh, but at least have a general idea of what the questions are and the order in which they are. Because there is a very high chance that you're gonna ask a question and it's gonna prompt your participant to start talking about something else that's halfway down your guide, right? And so you're not gonna say, oh, wait, 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 can you just stop? We're gonna to get to that eventually. Not a good idea. You should let them keep chatting. You can check the box, hey, I've gotten there, and then you can keep on rolling. So again, knowing the guide is gonna be really important. It's also gonna be important for you um, so that the conversation can flow a little bit more naturally. Um, and then you're also going to want to make sure um, that you're actively listening to what your participant says. As we all know, when we're conversing with people, we tend to not always um, participate in active listening. Active listening is where we're engaging that conversation in real time, being present in the moment, and not thinking about what we're going to say next. And so we want to be really conscious of sort of this half listening where you're like ready for the next question. You wanna make sure that you're engaging with what they say. Um, and even if you have to take a pause before you get to the next question, that's completely acceptable. 
Um, if you take notes, can you just skip down to that and start making notes? Yeah, absolutely. If you, if you take jottings or take notes, you can just skip down. Um, but um, I am going to make uh, one just quick tidbit about jottings is making sure that they don't become too distracting unless that person has refused to be audio recorded. Um, that's happened to me several times. And so what I do um, just as a sidebar, I um, put them on speakerphone or if I'm in person, I bring out my computer and I type as fast as I can. Um, and then I can go back through and fill in. I usually type on the interview guide, um, a copy of it because I can follow along based on the questions that I ask. I do not transcribe me, but I do the best I can to capture them. And I get about 50%. Yeah, Michael. Uh, well, I would just say though, on uh, many occasions I've had recordings fail and other kinds of things. And so, I mean, I always say you should take some notes and yeah. I also use the interview guide to keep track of time when they say something so that when I wanna go back and find it, I can just have the time code and I just write down what was the time when they said it. So there's little things I think you can use that for, but yeah, I don't think you wanna be trying to write down everything they say. Totally. Um, I will say in, my, in the beginning for me, just to get comfortable in an interview, I found myself overwriting. Like I just felt like I should capture everything simply because you are worried about technology failing or things just not getting captured. Um, and so as I become more com a confident researcher, I've sort of um, did something a little bit similar, just doing jottings and making notes of things that are most important, as well as things I want to ask. Because if somebody says something and I'm really, they, it piques my interest, I'm going to jot it down and remember to go back to that to find a good time to introduce that concept that, or to ask probing questions to follow up. Um, but my next bullet was to test the equipment <laughs> and have a backup plan <laughs> um, because technology, as we all know in our Zoom world these days, um, is, is probably potentially going to fail at some point. Um, but we also want to make sure our equipment is not obtrusive. And this is especially true if you're in person with somebody. Um, the audio recording device that I have when I'm in person is literally about this big. So you, you lose track of it. You don't even notice that it's there. Um, and so also thinking about how to have a backup as well. Um, I also put the all the information about the interview on before I have the meeting. So in the car or whatever outside, who am I talking to? What am I talking about? Where am I? What is the time of day? So oh. that you have all that. It's easy to go from recording to recording and you don't have to go searching for that later on. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, quick question. Do we have IRB in Australia? <laughs> okay. <laughs> You guys aren't one of those lucky countries that don't have it. <laughs> oh no, lots of ethics applications. Takes a long time. A long okay, time. okay. Um, well, so in starting the interview, uh, we always want to address those ethical um, components. And so um, for us, you know, it's the Institutional Review Board. Um, I always ask again for a verbal confirmation that they're okay being audio recorded. I know they fill out their informed consent and they send it to me. I don't know if they read it, but I just want to make sure again, hey, are you okay being um, being audio recorded? Sometimes they are. And again, whip out the computer, type as quickly as you can. Um, but it's really important to start with making sure that they have, if they have any questions. Again, I let them know there's no right answers. There's uh, no right or wrong answers. I'm just interested in your own experiences. Um, and then we begin, right? So, but I would do want to add one thing about uh, rapport building. So when you're thinking about how to lessen some of that power distance, um, your email exchanges, uh, small talk in the beginning, all of that goes into making that person feel more comfortable and having a conversation with you. So I got a question in the chat. About sampling, what can we do if a group of potential participants do not accept to be interviewed? For example, participants, potential participants with the most critical perspectives. Um, that's exactly when I would utilize um, the ability to just take notes and, and ask them if to be included in the study, would they be comfortable with you just taking notes based on what they shared? Um, sometimes it's helpful um, in the beginning to also talk about how you're gonna represent them in your data. Um, so I talk about you know, that it's gonna be aggregate data. I'm gonna use pseudonyms, um, no uh, identifying information will be shared. 
and to kind of go over what that means for them so that they can maybe feel more comfortable um, being included in the study and then maybe potentially being audio recorded. They might wanna know what you're doing with those audio recordings, who's gonna hear them. Um, as I mentioned, that case study for the government contractor, there was a lot of concern about who's going to hear these. Am I going to play them for their bosses as soon as I collect the data? And I was the only one that had access. And so some of that stuff made them feel a little bit more comfortable, but you really have to kind of maybe go over it, spend some time with that. And so I think that's a really nice thing to do, Shima, in the beginning is to kind of make them feel a little bit more comfortable. But I would say if they if they're like, hey, this, you know, the audio recording thing is not for me, I don't want to do it, then say no problem, I'm just going to take notes while we talk because everybody should be included in the study. Um, and I, there's nothing wrong with that. And you can include that in your method section, a reviewer is going to understand that it's not going to impact the quality of your data or your study or anything along those lines. Do you, do you have, I think she was also asking about when people don't want to be interviewed at all. Do you have any oh. suggestions for her on that? Yeah, um, if you don't want to be interviewed at all, um, I I have never run into that. Like if I'd gotten so far as sitting down with you and then they say, no, I'm not interested in this study, but I have had people tell me up front that they're not comfortable being part of the study and you just keep going. Um, so that's kind of where um, you're just going to have to keep going down your list of potential participants. The study I mentioned about um, capturing academics lived experience, um, we had 21 participants in our study. I think we contacted over 150. <laughs> and that's simply because academics in the midst of COVID, who's got time for a 45 minute interview with some other researcher? Um, and so it just took a lot longer for us to be able to reach those, to reach a sample size that we felt comfortable that represented both of our research questions. So thank you, Michael, for clarifying. That was a great question. Um, so beginning interview, again, mentioned rapport building, making people feel comfortable, um, and then starting broadly. So the question that I usually start with, given my area of interest and probably similar to you all, is tell me a little bit about your professional background. That automatically makes people feel comfortable, right? So that, People are happy to talk about themselves. Some people will talk longer than others, but again, they just get comfortable with that particular conversation. And then you're gonna move into um, more of specific questions that are related to your research question. So these are gonna be your non-directive questions, sort of grand tour questions you might've heard. Um, Lindloff and Taylor refers to them as grand tour. And um, in my interview guide that you guys read for the paper that was in Journal of Public Relations Research, the question was how or what comes to mind when you hear the term employee engagement? That question initially was, how do you define employee engagement? And my advisor um, at, at the time suggested that is really intimidating, asking the PhD student, asking participants to define something, right? So there, there, it felt like there had to be a right answer. And his suggestion was, what comes to mind when you hear the term employee engagement? And people would just start sharing their experiences. And then I transitioned on to talk about experiences. And the thing that was nice about that is that they talked about employee engagement from their perspective, it wasn't mine. And then they gave experiences related to their, their definition of employee engagement. So I wasn't guiding um, or sort of putting out what I thought it was. It was coming from their own experience. And so that was a really nice way to sort of avoid um, interjecting my perspective or the literature's perspective, because I was really curious about, you know, what is the lived experience for employees when it comes to engagement? Um, we want to be question careful with a couple of questions, though, when we're working through interviews is to avoid uh, what if questions, these if questions, um, asking for them to assess other people's experiences. This will happen. They're going to start talking about their neighbor down the street who had such and such experience, and it's going to, you're going to have to find a way nicely to pull them back to the conversation because that they can't. They're just having perceptions about what someone else's experience was. We're really interested in their own lived experience, um, and then we can get to more directive questions, right? That guide us, guide our conversation, and sort of set the parameters that help us answer our research question. 
One of the reason that sample uh, spreadsheet is helpful and the memoing is helpful is it's going to make sure it's going to allow you to make sure that your interview guide is answering your research questions, which is why we begin data analysis right away. I've always um, made adjustments to my interview guides based on what the data is saying, and there would be nothing worse than conducting 20 interviews and being like, holy crap, I didn't ask that one question. That would have been really helpful. The other thing that I would encourage you to do is to have a list of probes. Um, at my interview guide that you saw in the paper, there was, you know, what were you feeling? What were you hearing? What were you thinking? Blah, blah, blah. Those are great probes, but also something simple as, uh-huh, interesting. Tell me more. Echoing what they're saying. Um, again, wanting to elicit a more deeper um, response, and those don't need to be in a guide. They can just be a natural way that you respond to what somebody is sharing. Um, concluding the interview, I conclude the same way every time, and that is, that's all the questions I have for you today. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you feel as though would be important for me to know? And there always is. <laughs> they always come up with something that they wanted to include, um, some piece of data that was really important to include. And so I would always encourage you to have that piece of information. Um, to or excuse me, that question so that you can gather that additional information. And then I like to always say thank you and then explain next steps. And so usually that's where I drop in. I'm gonna be developing an exec executive summary. I'll send it to you, um, you know, once I've gotten to that point. Um, last couple of things, it's okay uh, to then turn off your recorder, but don't run away from the interview. There, this, there's always little nuggets that are gonna pop up. They might say a couple of things, so don't feel like you have to rush away. Um, and then, um, you know, making sure that you're taking notes as soon as you've completed. So I, those memos that you see in that spreadsheet, once I have left the interview, I'm by myself, um, whether that's from my pad that I would put my notes typed into the spreadsheet or just some other sort of aha moments that I've had that I capture those. Um, because again, this is how you begin to preliminarily, preliminarily identify findings and themes, as well as identify any issues. And then last, is there any follow-up? Um, especially if you're looking to rely on snowball sampling, because you can always ask, is there somebody that's had a similar experience or a dissimilar experience that you think I should talk to? And this is a really great time um, to do that. Any questions about the interview process? Cool. A um, couple other things I want to say about the um, data analysis, or excuse me, data collection before we get to analysis, is the audit trail. Go ahead, Michael. Well, Mitchell put his hand up. You might not be able to oh, see it. Sorry, I didn't see it. Mitchell, go ahead, please. That, that's okay, Laura. Look, I had a question that's sort of, it's connected to the interview process. And yeah. I was just um, regarding the use of hypotheses, you know. So I know with, in designing our studies and in designing our interview guides, we have some idea of what we're going to find before we enter the field and conduct our analysis. And yet when we use, dare to use the term hypotheses in a, in a journal article, we often get told to remove that. Um, yeah. Is this just a, a hangover from... The debate between qualitative and quantitative researchers and about qualitative researchers not you know making positivist claims by using such terms would you would you use like a hypothesis for instance in a study i would it? not and i and i think it's because for me when i think of qualitative research i'm looking at understanding how and why and if and if you are going to use um hypotheses to me, it says, okay, then I'm going to do deductive data analysis. So I'm going to go in with my code book. I'm going to analyze from this perspective, because this is what the literature told me I would find. Um, and you might find it, but you might find something different. And so I would encourage you then to go a little bit farther and say, okay, well, the, I found what the literature said I was going to find, but what else is, what else is missing? And so, um, we're interested, qualitative researchers are interested in asking questions, not looking to confirm. And so I think that that is probably just a different um, epistemological perspective. Um, doesn't mean you can't use the word that um, we're hypothesizing, right? We're guessing, we're, we're assuming that this might happen, but we, uh, we don't wanna put together specific hypothes hypotheses for qualitative work. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Um, all right. So one little piece of uh, best practices for me is the audit trail. Um, and so we all pr probably are familiar with Lincoln and Guba, 1985. 
um, establish the checks for trustworthiness. We use these instead of reliability and validity um, because Lincoln and Guba argued, hey, these really don't fit for qualitative work. Instead, we have credibility, transferability, dependability, confirmability, and integrity to assess the quality of qualitative research. And so one of the ways that we can do that and build credibility is through the audit trail. And it's staying organized. And so we can do it through a couple of ways. One, labeling files. This seems so, so, like, so elementary, but I try and label my files the same way every time. So I've got a folder for um, interviews. I've got a folder for transcript. Um, and they're labeled the same way. So transcript, the name of the organization, and the name, I would have taken a screenshot, but it's going to reveal too much information um, for my participants. But I just think having an audit trail, so you could have somebody sit at your computer and you could show them exactly how you got to the different steps in your data collection process is going to be key and enhances the credibility of your data. Um, and something that similarly with data analysis, you're going to want to have those steps established. And so I'm going to talk about that here in a second. So audit trail is important and the sample spreadsheet also helps with establishing an audit trail. So in terms of best practices and data analysis, um, I like steps. <laughs> I want to be able to show steps. Um, and this is probably you know, part of it is, again, thinking about how do we justify qualitative methods, the, you know, how we did the things that we did. A lot of times when I review journal articles, the analysis section is like this big and it makes me very concerned. And I am really concerned also about the findings because if I can't trust your analysis, then I really can't trust um, your findings. And so I would really encourage everybody to think about, or at least the PhD students in the room, uh, the steps that they follow in their, their data analysis. Again, thinking of an, as an audit trail. You know, if you're going to show somebody, your advisors, how you got to where you are, you want to show specific steps. Um, because the quickest way to undermine our research is poor data analysis. And so we want to make sure that we have steps that help us stay focused not to get over uh, overwhelmed, um, and then to recognize that analysis should begin right when we start data collection because uh, the emergent design nature of qualitative work means that things are going to emerge, shift, and change as you navigate your research process. And you aren't going to know what those things are unless you are beginning some preliminary analysis in the beginning. So let's think about our steps, capture them as you go. These are generally close to mine. Um, but you know they might shift and change for you depending on your approach. Again, there's a method to the madness. As long as you explain to us what it is, us meaning reviewers and the colleagues in the field that are reading your work, it's gonna be helpful. I think this also helps us transition um, and helps increase the rigor for qualitative research. And so um, I we think we've gotten to a place where people aren't devaluing the work, um, but I just, these things help that that ontological and epistemological conversation in the literature. So the first thing that we should all do is listen to our audio recordings alongside our completed transcripts. Whether you did the transcripts yourself, which is not fun, but sometimes necessary, or um, if you paid somebody to do that. So no matter who did the transcription, the very first thing you should do is listen to the audio recordings alongside those transcripts so you can have an intimate knowledge of your data. Uh, for me, then I move into in vivo. So that's the uh, platform that I choose to use. Um, I was just served on a dissertation committee for the qualitative, as the qualitative method person. And he uh, used printed sheets and highlighters and envelopes and cut things up and file them away. And that's just as cool. So um, whatever your method is, just make sure that you're clear about that. Um, but for me, I like in vivo for open coding and the collapsing of codes simply because it saves time, it saves effort, and it really helps with rigor. Um, what most people don't know that don't use in vivo, um, the computer is not analyzing the data for me. It's really just an organizational tool to ensure that it is a seamless process in data analysis. So when I say open coding, right, we're going through, we're looking for things that are relevant to the research question. Um, open coding to Mitchell's question earlier, it might not be open coding. He might have a code book because he's looking to confirm or maybe contradict something that's already in the literature. And so he might have a pre-code book that he's developed. Um, and so he takes more of a deductive approach. I um, tend to rely on an inductive approach initially, letting my research question drive my data analysis. And Vivo also allows us to 
collapse the codes, um, those that are repetitive. So that's what I do my first, that's kind of like a two and three step in in vivo. And then I move to Excel. I'm gonna show you here in just a second what that looks like. I use Excel for theme development and writing. I refer to it as a coding tree. We might've been familiar with that, um, but it's helpful because you can write, I write from Excel and you're gonna see that what it looks like right here. So this is actually not for my dissertation because there was way too much revealing information. So I tried to grab something from this other study I'm working on. What you can see here is on the left, I've got my uh, research questions. Um, so the left column would have been a research question. Those were codes that came from in vivo. And then I inserted all of the, the um, participant statements that were relevant to that particular theme or code. Um, the reason I like to do this in Excel is because I'm a visual learner and in, in, in vivo, you can only see one code at a time. You can't see multiple codes in one space. Um, and so Excel allows me kind of to spread out a bit so I can have a better idea of my data in one place. Um, so we had some questions that were regarding um, science communication, their strategy, um, was it decentralized, centralized, or a mix of both. And so I've put in all of the quotes from participants that were relevant to this particular aspect. And so in, in vivo, what I ended up doing was coding everything that talked about decentralized, centralized, and then a mix of both. And I did have some strategy. And so I was able to put these together and then that ended up being one of the themes for one of the research questions for this paper. You can see that anything in red is what I've used and anything in black, I haven't. Um, so sometimes you can see that some quotes are a lot longer and I can't fit all of it in, right? So we are limited in space. Um, when it comes to writing findings. And so this allows me to pull out what's most important. It also allows me to make sure that everyone is represented. So if I review an article and you tell me I have 20, you had 20 participants, I'm going through and I'm counting to make sure you had 20 people represented in your findings. Um, of course, it's a little bit more difficult with focus groups, but I wanna make sure that everybody was represented because the reality of the situation is you're going to have some really good people that share a lot of awesome information and you wish you could write your findings based on those five people's experience. <laughs> but you have 15 other people that somewhat contributed, so you've got to find a way to work them in. And so, for example, in this particular spreadsheet, there might be might have been like the G, GP from Tulane. I've already used that person several times, so I didn't use your, their quote here, but I had other ones um, that were that were there, right? But you can see there the person from Virginia Tech said it's kind of been passive. That's not a really robust quote, but I needed to include that particular person. So this gave me a great opportunity to do so. So I use this sort of format to write, um, to double check, to make sure everybody's represented. And then it really helps lay out my themes so they are fully developed and I can see everything at one time. Um, the last piece and the last step in data analysis is what we call imaginative variation, asking questions of the data so that we can make sure that we didn't miss anything. In vivo allows us to run queries. We can do that to see if there's uh, keywords that pop up um, more frequently than others that might give you some insight. Um, you can use your spreadsheet and go and have a debrief session with somebody uh, for the PhD folks in the room, how research question one for my dissertation, how I came to the zones of engagement, which is published in the public relations review, um, was a spreadsheet conversation with my advisor who had another view of it. And he said, I think this is what's going on. And um, we just had a really robust conversation and it led to more refining, uh, more refinement of my findings. And so the this, this particular approach can be helpful in both ways. So in vivo for imaginative variation, um, Excel, and then there's other platforms that are out there. Um, Leximancer is one of them. It is a, actually more of a data analysis software. Um, not a fan of it in that way, but it is a good way for trustworthiness and to sort of double check your data um, in, in the same way you would double check it with in vivo. Any questions about data analysis? Cool. All right, so transitioning to the last section here, um, about building trustworthiness um, and self-reflexivity through mindfulness. And so the second piece that I provided um, from the qualitative report kind of 
captured um, this concept and it's actually something that I have um, under review right now as a book. And so fingers crossed that they come back and say yes. Um, because as, and, and those of us that have read a lot of qualitative work, it talks, or excuse me, a lot of qualitative textbooks, it talks, oh, they talk a lot about building self-reflexivity, establishing trustworthiness, the role of the researcher, but nothing tells us how to do that. How do we become more self-reflexive? How do we become more engaged in the present moment? How do we um, show our participants that we're engaging in this process? How do we ensure that our mind, right, since the researcher is a participant in the research process, how do we ensure that we are actually <clears throat> engaged in that moment, whether that's collecting data or analyzing the data, right? Because our mind plays so much of a key role in the research process. And I'm not trying to dismiss that this isn't the same for quantitative researchers because it is, but it's just more important for a qualitative researcher. And so I see a wonderful connection between qualitative research and mindfulness. Um, a little bit of background, this stems from my PhD program. I actually took a mindfulness class um, at the PhD level while I was at Tennessee. We spent eight weeks doing the mind-body stress reduction uh, training, culminated in a day of silence, which was probably one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Um, and we didn't do any reading, we just experienced the first eight weeks. And then the second section of this, the semester was based, was reading content um, that helped reinforce what we were experiencing, right? So there's been a lot of research that is done that says it increases empathy and uh, self-awareness and decreases anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, from there, I started to just see a really wonderful connection with qualitative work. Um, and have started ex further exploring them. So John Kabat-Zinn, who is the sort of godfather of the mind-body stress reduction program, defines mindfulness as an awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment and practicing non-judgment of that experience moment by moment. So a couple of key things there. Awareness of the present moment, paying attention on purpose and practicing non-judgment. So there we can see how maybe that can be related to the qualitative research process. The reason being is because mindfulness can help us sort of lessen some of those habitual thought processes, right? Where we just sort of go on autopilot. We are under deadlines, right? Especially the students in the room, the assistant professors in the room, you know, we're trying to reach tenure, we're, we're trying to reach these goals. And so, you know, time is of the essence and we don't always have that time to, to, sit, to sit back, think and relax. And so, and give ourselves space, right? Space to be able to focus. And the, old, the whole idea with mindfulness is that it creates space. So we know that a window isn't a window until the panes have been cut out and now it has space. A bowl is not a bowl till we've cut out the inside and now it has space and it serves its purpose. And so mindfulness can be a really great tool for researchers to create space. And as I mentioned, with qualitative, right, the observer is in the world, right, of our participants. We are not outside of it. And our goal is to capture the participant's point of view at that moment with them. And so qualitative researchers could really benefit from this tool, both in data collection and analysis, um, because it helps us eliminate operating on an autopilot state with an undisciplined mind, where our mind becomes an unreliable instrument, which is not good <laughs> when it comes to qualitative research. Um, and so in doing so and in incorporating some sort of process, we become more attuned to our subtle thoughts um, which oftentimes are ignored. And so one of the ways that we can do that is develop a mindfulness practice. So mindfulness is simply um, spending time breathing, breathing exercises. Um, you can do uh, yoga as long as it's not too strenuous, but I really would encourage everybody, if this is something that you're interested in doing, um, is downloading an app, right? There's um, several that are free. Um, I use the Calm app and I do pay for the upgrade because there's a lot of guided meditations. And it's a matter of just something that you would sit and do for 10 to 20 minutes um, now, not in the midst of a huge research project, but it becomes part, a daily practice um, so that you can prepare for the field um, and not pick it up in the midst of the field because simply it's a practice that takes time. And in doing so, we're able to generate curiosity, openness, and tolerance for ambiguity because the reality of the research process is that it is underpinned 
by tons of ambiguity. And we have to be comfortable with that and mindfulness is gonna help us get there. So for the paper that you read, and this is how I approach all of my data collection, um, I participate in a 10 to 20 minute meditation before I collect data. Um, I did this for my dissertation. It was the first time I had ever done that. And so I journaled or memoed after the interview um, to capture my thoughts, feelings, and sensations. Um, in addition to the memos that you read, but I had another sort of uh, spreadsheet that I shared or that I um, collected, that I didn't share, that I collected this information. And so after I was done with all of my interviews, I did a brief thematic um, analysis of my, of my journal memos. And I found a couple of interesting things. And so I wouldn't have noticed these things had I not been um, paying attention on purpose in the present moment. And the first thing was, is that I found myself labeling the quality of an interview, good or bad, um, poor, too short, um, we didn't talk enough, um, but what we learn from mindfulness is that the practice teaches us not to label, right? So if you're having a body sensation in the midst of your practice, you shouldn't label um, what you're feeling, what you're hearing, and just instead accept what is and then move on. So particularly in this um, labeling situation, there was this woman who, um, whose interview, I think went about 29 minutes and I labeled it as bad, right? To that earlier comment of length of interview, what's a quality interview? And I'm like, shoot, 29 minutes, that's not a good interview. Surprisingly enough, when I went back and listened to the audio recording alongside the transcript, it was excellent. This woman was in a high profile executive. She only had 30 minutes for me. She spoke to the point succinctly uh, with clarity. I, I mean, everything she said I could have included in my finding section. And so it was a really good lesson for me about exercising non-judgment and, um, you know, not being, you know, not labeling interviews as they go, just accepting them as they are for what they are without um, feeling like I had to put a label on this particular piece. The other thing that I learned um, was about distractions. Um, and this, so these things that I learned at the time had utilized um, as I moved forward and that I was really distracted in my interviews, whether that was by my notes, I think I mentioned that, the email ping, the text vibration, uh, the time, I was like obsessed with the time, again, trying to get to that 40 minute interview and recognizing that in, in, in focusing on these distractions, it was taking me away from my uh, present moment. And so again, thinking about how I can heighten the awareness and instead of, you know, of course we can sort of block out some of those distractions, but the reality is they're always going to be there, right? The doorbell's going to ring, the dog's going to bark. And instead of getting caught up in it, you just let it go. Just like clouds in the sky, thoughts that you may have, mindfulness teaches us that, right? Teaches us that we should just let things go. And so what I've learned through this process is that uh, mindfulness can really help us exercise non-judgment, non-reactivity to the situation and acceptance of the experience, no matter what it is. Because the nature of qualitative work is that we're always gonna be dealing with human beings who um, are, un, you know, unpredictable and we and we have to be open to that process right and the emergent design of qualitative research also requires um, a comfortability with ambiguity and be open to things as they present themselves and in doing so we start to see the nuance right we start to um, become more engaged we start to become more open-minded and continuing to be involved in the research process, which is going to increase the quality of our data collection, as well as the data analysis, which therefore um, has a greater contribution to our field and to the practice. And so mindfulness is a really great tool um, for, for all of us. And in and, and, and all honesty too, you're gonna end up seeing um, some great impacts in your own life if you, are, if you do sort of embrace this sort of process, but it is incredibly helpful for the qualitative uh, researcher. So that's all I have for today. Um, I'm open to any questions, continuing the conversation. I'll leave this slide up just quickly in case anybody wants to connect with me after today. I am more than happy to have a further conversation about uh, qualitative research. I know I didn't talk much about my own research, but if that's something you're interested in having a conversation about, I'm more than welcome to um, entertain that. 
need any assistance um, in the future, I would love to continue. I love talking about my research. I love talking about qualitative research methods. I'm actually teaching um, the qualitative research method class at the PhD level this uh, fall at the University of Alabama. So I'd offer the um, PhD students in the room if, if there's a particular aspect of qualitative that you'd like to um, hop on, we're gonna be a hybrid class. Um, we meet in the evenings. It might be something that maybe you could join us for a class or two um, if you're interested in that as well. So my information is there um, if, if anybody would like to continue the conversation further. And I will get to... Um, Sume had a question and then... Yeah, Sume, do you wanna ask it to the group or do you want me to just read? Let's say, okay, do you have any experience where? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you have that kind of experience? Because I'm very interested. Like, I agree that we don't, we, yeah, about labeling and labeling sounds like judging, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but, yeah. You want, but you want to describe, like after you have done your interview, you want to write down like, how, what, how do you feel about that interview? But you don't want to label. Sure. But, yeah, so how do you, how do you, yeah, yeah, that's my question. <laughs> yeah, so okay. you, yeah, no worries. I think I get what you, if I'm, let me see if I'm answering this correctly. So yeah. um, there are definitely times when I do not agree with what the participant is saying, right? And so yeah. you're just going to have to say, mm -hmm, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can note that to yourself. Um, you can say, disagree, you know, okay. uh, this person is, you know, I've had, I have never had like a real negative person, but I've had people be uncomfortable. I spoke to a gentleman this past fall who um, is pretty high up at a university. And I asked him a pretty basic question and he was a complete jerk about it. And I said, hmm, okay, well, moving on, you know? Uh, so I, I, I just kind of let that go. But honestly, your memoing is a nice time for that. It's, it's a nice time to say, hey, this made me feel you know, uncomfortable. I didn't really agree with what this person was saying. Um, I'd even encourage you to say, well, ask yourself the question of, well, why do I disagree with him or her or they? Um, what, is you know, what, is, what is being brought up in me that might um, be coming out here and to have kind of exercise some self-reflexivity in that? Those memos, those memos are yours. Those memos are yours to, sh to share with only yourself, maybe an advisor, um, but it's just a nice time to sort of ex um, share your own research experience and put it on paper. So if I've had a uncomfortable conversation or I didn't really care for the person I was talking to, I, I utilize that memo to kind of just express myself. And that doesn't necessarily mean um, that we can't label it. I think what I just might, what I learned from labeling is I don't want to pigeonhole what I think this interview is and to be open to the complexity of the experience of what it is like to interview somebody and to not just say, oh, it was a bad interview because it actually was pretty good. And so, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't capture your own experience. Yeah, okay, you thank have, you. Have, you know, yeah, uh-huh. Anybody else have any questions? I yeah, I do. I was just typing it, but I, I can speak to it if that's easier. Um, thank you, Laura. Great presentation. Um, I was thinking about the different schools of, um, of not different schools, but although I suppose there are different schools of thought regarding qualitative research. You know, you've got grounded theory, you mentioned thematic analysis, you mentioned uh, phenomenology. Um, yeah. Those different approaches have their own key thinkers and their own language and their own epistemological tradition but in many qualitative studies today that's that that background is is, is getting forgotten almost and we're sort of seeing more of a, a generalist approach so i'm wondering to what extent do you think it is important for researchers today to to stick to one of those particular paradigms of qualitative inquiry or are we at a stage now where we can take the key ideas that we want like thematic analysis and coding and and then just move forward in a language that's more accessible and, and you know i guess more able to be replicated by other people yeah i think that's a great question um so each one of the traditions offers us something unique so i would say if you're looking to develop uh, a new theory 
um, I would take a grounded theory approach and I would follow Corbin and Strauss's step by steps of how they do that. Um, and same thing with phenomenology, but there are things that I take, right? I loved the, the concept of imaginative variation from my phenomenological study and I use that every time. And I will cite that in my, in my method section. And so I think it's just a matter of um, attributing where that came from. And so the one thing that I think raises questions actually is the grounded theory. And so when somebody says, I'm taking a grounded theory approach. I want to know: Are you actually doing grounded theory, or are you just using using the comparative data analysis, compare and contrast? Because that's how they develop the key concepts in grounded theory. But it's taking their data analysis approach, but you're not actually following all of the steps. And so I think it's just being very clear. Um, and so I think. You, as you can see, I'm very systematic as a qualitative researcher. And I think that clarity um, really helps avoid the confusion and, and can still speak to the, the, the greats of, of the past and says, this is what we're learning. This is what we're bringing forward. And I do think um, you can pepper in the, the differences as long as you explain how and why you're doing that and not just glossing over and say, I took a grounded theory and data analysis approach. Now I'm moving on to my findings. I don't know what that means, but if you tell me I did a comparative um, comparative ap approach similar to grounded theory because I wanted to develop key concepts, um, okay, cool, got it, thank you. I wanted to ask a quick question about collaboration. Um, uh, you, you mentioned a couple of times, you know, that wor working with others to help develop themes in particular is a really powerful part of this. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of us go through the dissertation process and do this largely by ourselves and then often do more collaborative work later on. Um, and so what, what are some maybe best practices for thinking about how to approach a collaborative qualitative project that might be different from doing one where it's just you? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Thanks, Luke. Um, I think you have to have your uh, roles outlined very clearly in the beginning. Um, and I think you can sort of split data collection down the middle, right? Um, however, mm -hmm. in a partnership, I've never really worked with more than one person, uh, maybe two, but never a giant team. Um, and so I feel as though working with another person is my strong suit. I like the co-partner, the partnership, um, simply because the roles can be a little bit more clearly defined. And in most of those cases, I am the qualitative expert. And so um, we split the, the interviews or the whatever data collection is down the middle. I will do initial open coding um, just simply because I feel more comfortable in that space, especially if I'm working with some quantitative folks. They're like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's okay. And then we come together and we talk about theme development. And so we'll move together from in vivo to Excel. Um, and work on ironing out those themes together. And then I tend to write the method section and the findings, um, especially if they're the subject matter expert, they'll write lit review, and then we together will write um, the discussion. And I have found that that approach is very helpful. Um, I still will take on projects individually, um, but I do like working with people and the qualitative research is definitely open. Um, it, it's a method that can be used with research teams. I think sometimes we think we have to do it independently, but we definitely don't. Just as long as those uh, are clear uh, ahead of time. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Uh, I am wondering if it's useful to talk about my identity in relation to other participants um, in my thesis. Yeah, so are you, um, tell me a little bit more about that. Are you meaning in writing? Um, so just one thing, uh, you should have a re researcher reflexivity paragraph that says who you are and who you come to the how you come to the research table. So as we read your work, we can learn a little bit more about you. Um, but are you talking about in your writing or in the research setting? Uh, in the writing. Okay. 
Yeah, I think it is important to have a paragraph um, that talks about researcher positionality or um, researcher reflexivity. Um, the piece that you read, there is a, par a short paragraph in there, so I know exactly who you are as a researcher. Again, so much of my conversation today has been about my role in the research process, and so I think it's important for people to know um, what I bring to the table and what identity, um, what identities impact my my role in the research process. And Thank for your you. yeah, and for your dissertation, it'll probably be a little bit longer, <laughs> like all things in the dissertation. <laughs> I'll try. How long? Short. Oh, really? You're lucky. <laughs> many, I don't know how many words is it. Sub, is that hundred? How many words are we capped at? Uh, 75,000? It, it should be maximum of 100,000 words. It's really short. And including citations? Mm, I don't think so, but. Oh, okay, okay. Just the body of the work. Okay, cool. It does vary from university to university. It okay. doesn't seem to be a sector wide agreement. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. One more quick one, because I, I can't help myself. Um, yeah. Look, is the, just in terms of uh, like a, the how-to manual that we should be giving to all our graduate students these days, when I was an undergraduate many, many years ago, it was the Handbook of Qualitative Research, I think, by Denzin and Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Is that still the go-to book for, you know, following these different schools and their steps by steps? Um, what do you give your own students to get them to be trained um, in this area? A lot of books. <laughs> Um, the, the one that I've been relying on for a big overview is actually Miriam and Tisdell, um, that recently came out. They do a really nice job, um, just with, it's like qualitative research. I think it's the sixth edition, um, a nice overview. And then I love to supplement that with Sage's, um, qualitative little book series. So it's like the little blue book and they have these little primers for each aspect of the qualitative research process. So they've got one on focus groups, one on interviews, one on writing, one on data analysis, uh, netnography, whatever you kind of want to deep dive in. And so it's a really nice uh, tool for that. And then for case studies, I think Yin is the go-to person for that. Um, so that's a separate book. Um, so yeah, I've got the primers, Miriam and Tisdell, and then Yin. And then I do pull um, some from Denzin and Lincoln in terms of um, ontology and epistemology, right? Because I think they do a really nice job setting the stage of qualitative research. That's usually where you'd find more information from them about um, the justification, the benefits, the value of qualitative, but not so much the uh, step by step. So I find that some of the other writers give us a little bit more of that tangible hands on that students need. So I think it's a combination of things. If I may, I, I'll say I'm a fan of Sarah Tracy's uh, mm -hmm. most recent book as well. Um, and I, I found her approach to be really practical and I think in, in ways that students respond to it might not be always the level of depth on some of those topics that we'd want for PhD students, but it's one that I referenced still doing this kind of work as well, just because it's very uh, process driven and clear. Mm -hmm. and, and she's a great one just to follow on social. She's always, I mean, she's got a robust website. I mean, she sells, shares syllabi and projects. That's and great. she is an open book when it comes to sharing resources for teachers. Great. Anybody else? Okay, I, maybe we'll wrap it up then. <laughs> well, this has been so wonderful and I'm really appreciative for all the questions and the engagement. I know we have a lot more seasoned scholars on the call, so um, I hope this was helpful, but That's definitely- great. Uh, good, good. So I, I was thinking, you know, for putting myself in the shoes of somebody working on a dissertation or embarking on a career um, as an assistant professor. And so um, you were my audience, but I am, again, as I can't, as I mentioned previously, happy to continue the conversation after today if you need any more additional resources. So thanks for having me, Michael, Maureen. I really appreciate it.
Thank you. We plan these for PhD students. So, I mean, I like that, you know, you, you talk to PhD students primarily, so it's good. Yeah. How many, I mean, just think about, she was gonna tell all of her PhD students that her advisor created a lecture series just for her. I so mean, cool. <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. It is really cool. All I did was take my grad students out for beer. <laughs> hey, that's just as good. <laughs> Those are the days. <laughs> yeah. Pre and well, Maureen, you, you, you make them take face to face for ages, so a beer for us would be aspirational. <laughs> you make them take you out for a beer. Oh, See, no, I, no, no, I can no. contribute something to the conversation. And that's what our advisors did. <laughs> <laughs> um, our advisors never bought us beer. My advisor <laughs> would take me to lunch once a year, and uh, you know, that was it. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, it's always good to see everybody. I think, Chuck, are you next? I'm not until September, I think. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah, I have to look and see who's there. I think um, uh, Sarah Deep might be next. Oh, Chuck. good. Okay, great. All right. Great job, Laura. I can't believe it's been five years. Isn't that crazy? So are you going up for tenure this year? Uh, next year. So I'm about to begin my fifth year. So oh, okay, I've, good. Woo. Yeah, so I've completed four and... Um, my tenure packet will be distributed next summer. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So. All right. Fingers crossed. I know. <laughs> I don't think you're going to have to worry. It should be quite strong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's been great to see everybody, some familiar faces, and hopefully we can connect again in the future. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Th thanks for posting these, Michael. This, this is great. Appreciate it. I already know, Laura, I've got a couple honor students who are going to make watch this because they're